GD 1103, Setting Out Plans, with Duncan Heather. While I consider the sketch plan stage of the design process to be little more than a discussion document, giving the client an overview of your ideas, once the scheme has been agreed, you have to become a technician and consider the practical side of the planning process. Clarity of instruction and technical competence are essential in order that the design may be first of all priced and eventually constructed. Very rarely is it possible to put all of the information onto one drawing. As the level of detail increases, so does the scale of the drawings and the amount of information required. The accurate setting out of the scheme moves it from a sketch plan to a working drawing. Loose, hand-drawn lines become fixed as you input the project into CAD. You can't expect to get the sketch plan stage of the design process 100% resolved, and the setting out drawings enable you to refine your thoughts and fine-tune the drawing. Practicality will also check things like widths of drives, paths and perglers to ensure they are ergonomically designed. It also allows you to confirm accurate levels and therefore define the heights of paving, retaining wall, steps and banks, etc. It also defines the virtual issues such as drainage and other services, as well as defining the levels of detail required for the project. It allows you to firm up the loose freehand drawings and turn your loose curves into geometric curvilinear design. But most importantly of all, it allows you to produce a set of highly detailed documents that allow several contractors to competitively price the project and eventually not only set it out but construct the scheme as well. The following may be done practically. The contractor will expect a level of competence in the drawings which reflects the ability of the designer. Do not try to cram too much information onto one drawing. Cascade the information and do not show unnecessary information. The level of accuracy will depend on the area of the garden and the information related to. For example, the edge of the lawn in the last third will not need the accuracy of the construction of, say, a pool adjacent to the house. Think of the setting out process as the reverse of measuring the survey. Information needed to plot the survey is exactly the same as the information needed to set out the scheme. There are several methods to provide setting out information. Each can be used in conjunction with the others. Always put yourself in the contractor's shoes and try and imagine what information you would need to set out the design yourselves. The contractor should never need to scale from the drawing, in that he should never have to use a ruler to measure from the drawing. It's the designer's duty to provide every measurement the contractor requires clearly and accurately on all drawings. Just as triangulation is used for the initial site survey, so it can be used to help set out the new design. Primarily, triangulation is used to set out the centres of circles or to possibly plot accurately the position of new buildings in relation to the house. There are four different graphical styles that can be used depending on the complexity of the drawing or the designer's own preference. The solid line method 
as seen here, is used to plot the position of the new gouge accurately in conjunction with the existing house. This method gives clear, unequivocal instructions to the contractor as to the dimensions used and the points from where they are taken. The dotted line method is similar. In this example, it's used to identify the center point of a curve, to which is added a radius, which we'll see in the next slide. Both methods provide the clearest instructions to the contractor, providing the drawings are not too complicated. The next two measurements are better for drawings which have more information on them. The idea is that you avoid crossing lines on your drawing, so it's less likely that mistakes can be made. In BF, only the dimensions have been included, while in AF, part lines have been used to reinforce the measurement points. This next slide shows the use of radii, which are used in conjunction with triangulation to construct the curves of beds, lawns and ponds. You can see from the slide that once the contractor has identified the curve center, all they need to do is to set out a tape measure with the radius. They can either mark off the circumference with marker paint, or use two tapes consecutively. And when the first tape meets the second, the second circumference takes over from the first. In some layouts, which involve both straight and curved lines together, the radii information can be combined with angles, called polar measurements, which can be seen in the next slide. Polar measurements are not as popular as other methods of setting out, as they involve the contractors owning or being able to use a theodolite in order to accurately lay out precise angles on the site. In its simplest form, you can set up a 45 degree angle using a building, as shown on the example on the screen. But anything more complicated than this would involve survey equipment that is complicated to use, expensive to own, and only the largest of contracting firms are likely to have this readily available. Axes, on the other hand, are much easier to set out and therefore easier for the contractors to use on site as they only require the ability to set up a 3, 4, 5 triangle, as discussed in GD702. They can be used to identify the centre of a circle, but there is more of a margin of error, and I would personally prefer to use triangulations for this. But where they come into their own is when used in conjunction with offsets to lay out avenues of trees and other uniform elements in the design. Lastly, we will look at offsets, used to set out more freehand organic curves. Having set up a baseline, in this case a boundary wall, you mark off regular intervals with a tape measure in this case, we start with one meter and move into two meter intervals where the curves become softer. And then vertical dimensions are plotted at 90 degrees to the baseline and the points marked with either sand or marker paint. The dots are then joined together to create an accurate replication of the curve on the drawing. Which methods of setting out you use will depend on the complexity of the site and the experience of the contractor. But try and make these instructions as clear and uncomplicated as possible. 
always put yourself in the contractor's shoes and ask yourself, would I understand this? The designer should assess the scheme and decide what information will be required to both price and construct the works. Think drawings, specifications and schedules. Remember drawn information is portrayed in plan, elevation and section. Plan the presentation. Make a drawing list and decide what to show on each drawing and at what scale. It is unlikely that you'll be able to show all of the information on a single drawing. One of the major advantages of CAD is that it allows you to use the same information in several different ways and at several different scales. When moving your freehand sketch plan into CAD, I recommend setting up the following design layers. A site survey, sketch plan, key plan, paving detail, levels and drainage, construction drawings, and planting plans. And then make sure you use the specific design layers for their specific set of information. And these, in combination with individual classes and later sheet layers, you can create any number of information permutations. Use a drawing as the key. This will usually be the sketch plan. Cascade the information down the drawing hierarchy from the smallest to the largest scale. Always cross-reference drawings to one another and always to specifications and schedules. Remember the function of the scale to area is a square. So to go from 1 to 200 to 1 to 50, the area will, you will be able to cover is 1 16th of an A1 sheet at A5. Don't schedule too many drawings, but don't cram information on the drawing either. Information on this sheet should include existing site features and services, what you should retain, what to remove and demolish, where site compounds may go, for instance site offices, temporary toilet blocks, and contractors car parking, access, delivery and storage areas. Assign a specific area of the site for the storage and delivery of materials, skips, bonfires etc so as not to mess up the site more than necessary. Protection and security, such as fences to protect or restrict access to parts of the garden, as well as protective fencing around existing trees and planting to be retained. Key drawings. These are like the front pages of a car atlas map where you turn to the first page and see the country divided up into little boxes with numbers, depicting the page numbers, so you can go straight to the detailed map showing the roads on which you're travelling. Cascade drawings are usually at a larger scale and show more detail, also cross-referenced to other drawings and specifications. Cascading down to a larger scale detail, even to full size. These drawings are almost sub key drawings, showing setting out, levels, drainage, including gullies, soakaways, and manhole and drain runs, services, including electrical supply and switching, lighting, water, gas, telecom, and ducting 
materials and finishes, planting beds, and the planting plans and specification clauses. I prefer to divide the cascade drawings up into two sets of information, so drawings don't become too confused or overcomplicated. Drawing 1 deals with the dimensions and paving detail. You will also notice some numbers on the plan. These cross-reference the drawings with the specification documents, CGD 1106 which makes up part of the package of information. See key plan and cascade drawings in the student download files and software section for an example. Drawing 2 covers exactly the same area, but includes the drainage and existing and new spot heights. Detailed drawings. These drawings are again used at a larger scale showing more detail, also cross-referencing to other drawings and specifications, and would typically show hard landscape features such as pools, pergolas, steps, paving details, retaining walls and movement joints. These construction details can cascade down further. In this case, starting with a drawing at 1 to 100 and moving down to 1 to 25 for the step cross sections, then down to 1 to 10 for the slot drain, and finally down to 1 to 4 for the step detail to show the masons how I want the nosing of the step detailed. The specification is usually included in the front half of this information pack, which makes up part of the legally binding contract and is also part of the tender package, set out to several contractors for them to price so the client has a choice of contractor based on a price comparison basis. Schedules and management plans are often included in the tender package, most often when associated with the soft landscaping, but also with section B of the specification if the client has employed a quantity surveyor to supply a bill of quantities. These would normally only be considered on jobs of £100,000 plus. As the job becomes too large to expect a contractor to quote for without providing a schedule of materials. You have to remember that contractors are busy people. If they have a lot of work on, they may feel it's too much trouble to calculate the materials required for a job, and the designer may struggle to find contractors willing to submit a tender unless a bill of quantities is supplied. It's up to each individual to decide how and what to show. But remember, it's got to be built. The more information, the more accurate the built form, the less risk and the more likely to be completed on time and on budget. The designer should use key drawings, cascade information in the most logical and clear way. You should remember to cross-reference information don't create unnecessary drawings and don't show unnecessary information. And if you don't know it, don't show it.